Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation this morning in our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I would ask everyone here in-house if you'd be so kind to check that cell phones have been turned off as a courtesy as we prepare to begin. And we, of course, will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference following our presentations. And we remind our internet viewers uh, and those watching on video at any time that comments or questions can be sent to us simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion is James Phillips, Senior Research Fellow for Middle Eastern Affairs in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign and National Security Policy. He is a veteran foreign policy specialist who has written widely on Middle Eastern affairs and international terrorism since 1978. He is a former research fellow at the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress, as well as a former joint doctoral research fellow at the East-West Center. Since 9-11, Mr. Phillips has written extensively on the global war against terrorism and its implications for U.S. policy. He has also testified before Congress on Middle East security issues, including the Arab-Israeli Arab conflict, Iranian nuclear issues, and <coughs> Middle Eastern terrorism. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Jim Phillips. Jim. Thanks, John. And welcome to Heritage. Uh, I think with the uh, signing of the interim agreement on April 2nd, uh, the Obama administration now has an agreement uh, in principle with a regime that has no principles except to expand its uh, power and export its Islamic revolution. Uh, the agreement in principle is very slippery. It, it's been so vague that there is disagreement over exactly what was actually agreed to. The Iranians have released their own fact sheet, which uh, contradicts uh, many points in the U.S. fact sheet. So clearly there's no deal yet. Uh, negotiations could still bog down. Uh, Congress could block a, a proposed deal. Or uh, uh, the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, may veto a deal, as he did back in 2009 when he blocked a deal, a proposed deal. Uh, between the Obama administration and uh, President uh, uh, Ahmadinejad. Uh, with these caveats, uh, we need to look at the emerging details of this deal to look at some of the pitfalls in the negotiations. Uh, and uh, we're very well positioned to do that today with a, a panel of uh, very knowledgeable experts. Our first speaker will be Fred Flights. Uh, he's the Senior Vice President for Policy and Programs at the Center for Security Policy. He served as an intelligence uh, analyst for 19 years for the CIA and DIA, uh, working on WMD, or Weapons of Mass Destruction, uh, WMD proliferation, the Balkans, the United Nations, and other issues. From 2001 to 2005, he was a Senior Advisor and Chief of Staff to the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, uh, John Bolton. During his State Department assignment, he followed the Iranian nuclear program and served as a U.S. delegate to the International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference, and the Biological Weapons Convention Review Conference, as well as the U.N. General Assembly and the Conference on Disarmament. From there, he moved to the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, where his portfolio included WMD proliferation, Iran, and North Korea. Since November 2013, Fred has been a senior fellow at uh, the Center for Security Policy and now uh, senior vice president, where he specializes in the Iran nuclear program, uh, the threat from radical Islam, and issues related to the Snowden leaks and NSA reform. Our second speaker will be Gregory Jones. He's the senior researcher at the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. He served as a defense policy analyst for uh, the past 41 years, uh, including stints at uh, the Panuristics, Albert Wolstetter's uh, famous think tank. Over the course of his career, a, a major emphasis of his work has been the study of the potential for terrorists as well as countries to acquire and use nuclear, chemical, biological, and radiological weapons and the formulation of policies and actions to control and counter these weapons. Since 2008, he's written over 20 papers and articles, 
as well as testified before Congress chronicling the progress of Iran's nuclear program and explaining how Iran could easily acquire nuclear weapons through its centrifuge uh, enrichment program. He's the co-author of the book Swords from Plowshares, as well as the author or co-author of over 80 reports and articles. And speaking uh, in batting cleanup is Henry Sikulski. Uh Henry is the executive director of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center, and he teaches at the Institute of World Politics in Washington. He served in the Pentagon as the deputy for nonproliferation uh, policy as a full-time consultant to the Secretary of Defense's Office of Net Assessment, as a consultant uh, to the National Intelligence Council, a member of the CIA's Senior Advisory Group, and as a Senate uh, legislative aide on nuclear energy and military affairs. He was appointed to the Commission on the Prevention of WMD Proliferation and Terrorism and to the Deutsche WMD Proliferation Commission and he has authored and edited numerous volumes on strategic weapons proliferation issues, uh, including most recently, uh, <coughs> Underestimated, Our Not So Peaceful Nuclear Future, and Best of Intentions, uh, America's Campaign Against Strategic Weapons Proliferation. And with that, let me just turn it over uh, to Fred. Thanks, Jim. Thank you all for coming today. I'd like to thank the Heritage Foundation for inviting me to discuss this uh, vital issue again. And, and to you, Jim, for, for your kindness and for inviting me to be here today. I want to talk about some of the recent developments concerning the Iranian nuclear program, but my presentation is going to focus on one single unacceptable con concession, which I believe got us into a very dangerous situation. My bottom line is that we are headed for a nuclear agreement that will be extremely dangerous, that will undermine U.S. national security, that will lead to a nuclear arms race in the Middle East and could lead to a Middle Eastern war. I'm also concerned that the agreement that we are racing towards will shorten the timeline to an Iranian nuclear weapon, contrary to what the Obama administration is saying. There's been some dramatic developments just over the last couple of weeks, and that seems to happen every time we have one of these, Jim. <laughs> um, uh, on April 2nd, President Obama announced a, a framework agreement. This is supposed to be an outline to get a final nuclear agreement with Iran. And this week, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee unanimously passed a bill to give Congress a role in reviewing this agreement. I believe these two developments could distract attention from what's really at stake here. So I'm going to try to get through that and then talk about this unacceptable concession. The framework was due some time ago, but after a couple of delays, um, it was produced in early April. It was due by the end of March. And according to the Obama administration, it is a, a uh, plan that will significantly improve <coughs> U.S. national security, that will delay an Iranian nuclear weapon for at least a year, and will bring Iran back into the community of nations. There are several parts to this agreement that I want to talk about. There's uranium enrichment. According to the Obama administration, there will be a substantial reduction in Iran's uranium enrichment effort. Uranium enrichment is the process of separating out the small percentage of the fissile isotope uranium-235, which is fissile, meaning it can undergo and sustain a nuclear reaction, <coughs> either as nuclear fuel for a weapon or, or in a nuclear reactor. Um, Iran currently has 19,000 uranium centrifuges, 9,000 of which are operational. Under the deal, Iran will keep about 6,000 5,000 of which will be operational. And this was uh, portrayed by the administration as, sig as a significant concession by the Iranians. Under this arrangement, Iran will either neutralize or reduce its enriched uranium stockpile. Um, it's unclear what that means, but uh, I know Greg Jones is going to talk about that, so I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. Um, the previous demand by the West was that all of Iran's enriched uranium would have to leave the country. But just before the framework was announced, there were press reports that Iran had backed away from that concession. So the rich uranium stockpile, which the Center for Security Policy believes Iran could use right now to make eight nuclear weapons, will remain in Iran. But what happens to it, as I said, is unknown. Then there's plutonium. Iran has a reactor, uh, the Iraq reactor, that's spelled A-R-A-K, the, the spent fuel rods of which <coughs> will be a source of plutonium when the reactor is finished. So according to the, the Obama administration, this reactor will be re-engineered. 
Now, there was a report by the Institute for Science and International Security that the core of this reactor will be removed so it will produce less plutonium. I'm again going to let my, my colleague Greg Jones talk about that in more depth, but according to the Obama administration, this will prevent this reactor from producing weapons-grade plutonium. My understanding is there's no way to, for a heavy water reactor not to produce heavy uh, uh, plutonium, but anyway, we'll let my colleague talk about that. On verification, we are told that this will be, this agreement will have the toughest verification provisions ever. Robust verification provisions. One national security advisor official said there will be any time, any place inspections, um, facilities, military facilities where there's possible weapons work ongoing will, will be subject to inspections. Iran will comply with the IAE additional protocol, which will give the IAE additional rights to inspect uh, facilities in Iran where there could be uh, illicit nuclear activities ongoing. This is a key point to this agreement, and it was played up by the Obama administration quite strongly. Then there's sanctions. According to the Obama administration, sanctions will be lifted in phases. They will be suspended uh, depending upon Iran's compliance with the final nuclear agreement. And they will snap back if Iran does not comply. Shortly after this was, uh, and one other thing, PMD, possible military dimensions. This is the United Nations euphemism for nuclear weapons research. Uh, there was an agreement that Iran signed with the IEA in November 2013 to resolve possible military uh, nuclear work in 12 areas. Only one area has been resolved, and according to the a fact sheet released by the White House, Iran will address these issues, but apparently down the road, not as part of an agreement to be signed by the end of June. So President Obama says that this agreement is, is a good deal, that the only alternatives is allowing Iran's nuclear, pursuit of nuclear weapons to proceed or war with Iran. In his opinion, there are no other alternatives. This is the only way to go. This is the best deal that we, we should get and, and the American people should support it. Well, shortly after the President made his statement, uh, the case made by the President and the State Department Secretary Kerry began to unravel. As you probably know by now, Supreme Leader Hamani has said that this, the statements made by this administration are false. We, they have accused the Obama administration of, of lying, especially in the fact sheet. Hamani has said that military facilities will not be subject to, to IAEA inspections. Sanctions, according to Iranian officials, must be terminated immediately, not suspended, as has been claimed by the Obama administration. Uh, the Obama administration claimed that advanced uranium centrifuges, some limited research could take place on them, but they could not be installed for at least 15 years. Uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif says that they're going to start installing these centrifuges immediately, including a centrifuge called the IR-8, which the Iranian government says is 20 times more efficient than their current centrifuges. According to Zarif, this will be installed shortly after a new agreement is implemented. Uh, so the, these were real concerns about uh, verification, sanctions, what was actually agreed to in the agreement. And then there are some developments from French and American officials that were left out of the, of the rollout of this agreement. According to a French fact sheet, which has been reported by an Israeli newspaper, I don't think they released it, in years 13 to 15 of this agreement, Iran will be allowed to install advanced centrifuges. This was left out of the American fact sheet. Last week, President Obama said in years 13 to 15 of this agreement, the timeline for an Iranian nuclear weapon could sink to zero. Now, the, the State Department quickly backpedaled and said that the President was talking about a scenario where there wasn't an agreement. Read what the President said. That's not what he was saying. The President accidentally told the truth about this agreement when he said that. So please read the NPR statement by the President on this timeline possibly sinking to zero. And that's what will happen if these advanced centrifuges are, are installed. In fact, I think it will happen faster than 13 to 15 years. But my, um, my, my colleagues who are better uh, equipped to discuss this can talk about that when, it, when it's their turn. Well, I want to talk about how we got into this situation. Um, uh, I think we have, a, a, we, we have a, a, a framework for an agreement that will severely undermine U.S. national security. 
Uh, we know that ballistic missiles have been left out of this framework. Iran's sponsorship of terrorism has been left out of this framework. For American citizens who are being held in an Iranian prison, I would say they're actually hostages, have been left out of this framework. Iran's effort to spread its influence throughout the Middle East by sponsoring terrorist groups and uh, proxy organizations has been left out of the framework. How did we get to this mess? In my opinion, it stems from one crucial compromise made in May of 2012. A lot of people were saying, well, this agreement is a result of 12 or more years of negotiations with the Iranians. That the Obama administration made, con uh, the Bush administration made concessions, and Obama's building on them. In my opinion, these talks are a result of one concession made by the United States in May of 2012 during multilateral talks, when we proposed to the Iranians that they could enrich uranium as part of a final deal. Enrichment of uranium is very dangerous because it is so easy to go from peaceful enrichment for reactor fuel or medical isotopes to making weapons-grade fuel. Now, our, our organization, the Center for Security Policy, believes you can make reactor fuel into weapons-grade fuel in two to three months. And I think Henry's organization has different figures. But it, it's a very short jump from, from these two uh, technologies. Iran has pursued every conceivable technology in secret to pursue nuclear weapons. Uranium enrichment, laser enrichment, plutonium production. There is ample evidence of weapons-related activity, such as creating uranium hemispheres, neutron initiators, plutonium work, all done in secret. It is hard to credibly argue that this is a peaceful nuclear program. And there are these 12 areas of possible military dimensions, only one of which Iran will explain. Iran has tried to write off the other, other uh, as fabrications by the United States and Israel, but it won't give an answer to what these, what these uh, areas uh, amount to. The United States has always been very careful about uranium enrichment and allowing other states to do this. When we signed a peaceful nuclear cooperation agreement with the United Arab Emirates in 2009, this was specifically left out because of the severe proliferation risk of enrichment. So the UAE, one of Iran's neighbors, is not allowed to enrich uranium, but Iran will be enriching uranium with up to 6,000 uranium centrifuges. The remainder of its centrifuges will simply be put on ice until this agreement is over. And it will be allowed to, to develop advanced centrifuges during the deal. So what did this concession really mean? First of all, we communicated to the Iranians that we will give anything, we will concede everything for a nuclear agreement with Iran. When we put this before them, we basically were saying, you, you tell us what you want, we want a deal so badly. And we've seen the number of centrifuges that we would agree to. The number has increased slowly over the years until we got to the point where we're now talking about letting them have 6,000 operational centrifuges. And as I said, about 5,000 they will be using. Iran has no conceivable reason to be enriching uranium. Iran would need 200,000 centrifuges to build fuel rods for its Bashir power reactor. So its claim that it needs these centrifuges to make fuel rods is false. Iran has said that maybe it needs uranium enrichment to make medical isotopes or fuel plates for a research reactor in Tehran. It is far too many centrifuges to do that. And even more frightening, Foreign Minister Zarif recently said that Iran wants to use its enrichment uh, capability to sell enriched uranium to other countries to, to, to make some money. Now, the prospect of a nation that developed its nuclear program in secret and in violation of UN Security Council resolutions selling enriched uranium on the open market, I find truly frightening. Who will they sell to? Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea? I'm just hoping Zarif was kidding, but I'm concerned that we conceded this in the nuclear talks. So here's my bottom line. And, and I, I believe this is a really bad deal that the Obama administration has tried to hide from the American people by inundating them with technical data. So I'm just going to make this very clear. Uranium enrichment should have been a deal breaker. When Iran said it would not agree to a nuclear deal without enriching uranium, it was saying it did not want a nuclear deal. It did not want a deal that would stop it from pursuing nuclear weapons. It is inconceivable and, frankly, indefensible that the United States would agree to a nuclear agreement with Iran that allows it to enrich uranium at all, any uranium enrichment, any centrifuges. We don't allow our friends to do that. It was inconceivable we allowed Iran to do that. 
but the Iranians are savvy negotiators. They knew what this meant. When we gave this up, we told them, whatever you want for a deal, we will give you. And we've now seen this on verification. We've seen this on sanctions. We've seen this on plutonium. We've seen an agreement that clearly will allow Iran to develop advanced centrifuges during the deal. And I think it's pretty clear that the Obama administration's account of advanced centrifuges has not been true. So we, we basically are agreeing to a deal that will allow, allow Iran to concede, uh, will allow Iran, Iran to produce a nuclear weapon. So what was the purpose of this framework? There's no document. I mean, we have different accounts by the United States, the EU, and Iran. Why is there no document? Why are the, all these differences? It's not simply that the Obama administration is pursuing something it can't defend. It's the fact that this framework had one purpose. That was to convince Congress not to pass sanctions. I don't think there is a framework, because there's no agreement. There's nothing tangible they can give us. This framework is a fraud. It is a fraud to convince the U.S. Congress not to pass additional sanctions to stop the Obama administration's uh, incredible desire to get a deal with the Iranians at whatever cost. So I, I simply find this completely unacceptable. It started with the uranium enrichment concession, which I think has just uh, led to a slippery slope that has resulted to a situation where we are in store for a very, very bad deal. It is my hope that Democrats and Republicans in Congress will look at this very closely and put politics aside and realize we cannot agree, allow an agreement like this to go forward. This will hurt our national security. It will endanger our allies. And I, I, I think it is perhaps one of the worst diplomatic agreements that has ever been negotiated by the United States. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Well, thanks. thanks, Fred. That was a very strong statement. Uh, Greg? Thanks, Jim. Uh, let me first just start again by refreshing your memory on our agreements. In November 2013, we entered into what was called the Joint Plan of Action, which set in motion these further negotiations and laid down various terms uh, that the current negotiations were going to go under. And now we have a Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, is this now current agreement that, as Fred said, we don't really have, but we have the parameters for from the uh, State Department uh, fact sheet. In, you know, even fact apparently has to be in quotes these days. Um, basically, of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, it's retained the two basic flaws that the Joint Plan of Action uh, built into it. And Fred's already discussed some of this. One, Iran's allowed to keep centrifuge enrichment. Two, the, the agreement has limited duration. Once the agreement's done, Iran's no longer bound by anything except standard IEA safeguards, which won't, won't restrain the centrifuge enrichment. So what this is saying is that Iran will have easy access to nuclear weapons, certainly once the agreement lapses. Now, it's taken a long time. You know, I've hammered on this point, especially the limited duration of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action for a long time, but it's taken a long time for this to sort of percolate into people's consciousness. But in the last couple of months it has. I mean, I'll point out that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was originally termed, termed the Comprehensive Solution when it was first mentioned. But people, people aren't using the word solution anymore. As Fred's already referred to, People were kind of taken aback when President Obama was saying, well, you know, maybe 12 good years if we're lucky, uh, you know, and saying, well, they won't, won't happen on my watch, which now only lasts 21 more months. Uh, and though the administration doesn't want to say it because it's a little too um, provocative, but others have realized that given the limited duration, this is basically a gamble on the change of regime in Iran. I mean, not necessarily the narrow regime change of, of uh, you know, blasting the government, but something, the new, what the New York Times called a different or at least more cooperative Iranian regime, which I personally think is quite far-fetched, but uh, there are a surprising number of people who are awfully hopeful that given 
given the next five or ten years we're going to see that. And I might mention, among other things, it's already been six years since the Green Movement uh, first occurred in Iran, and we haven't seen much, much change going on in Iran. They seem fully in control. And, you know, you, you could say, okay, well, you know, maybe even if it's a long shot, it might be worth doing if there weren't serious costs. And again, Fred's already referred to this, the fact that we've legitimized centrifuge enrichment. And we've done it not only for, for Iran, we've done it for everybody now. I mean, after all, if Iran can have centrifuge enrichment, I mean, how, how can countries that have been complying with IAEA safeguards not conducting uh, experiments in violation of safeguards, how can they be denied? And indeed, this, this isn't the first time that some country's been caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Uh, South Korea in 2004 was found to have done illicit uh, uranium laser enrichment. So what did the South Koreans do? Did they bulldoze the site the way the Iranians did? No. Did they suddenly say, oh, well, you know, yes, it was for weapons, but now, now we've suddenly discovered we, ha we have some peaceful use for it, and that's our inalienable right? I mean, no, the South Koreans gave it up. The U.S. forced them to give it up. This is to our, our friends and allies, but our enemies, they get, to, they get to keep centrifuge enrichment. And already we've seen the effects of this. I, Fred's referred to this also. Saudi Arabia has already said, well, if the Iranians get centrifuge enrichment, we get centrifuge enrichment. And we're looking at a Middle Eastern nuclear arms race, and not very far in the future. Now, getting to some of the specific terms of the comprehensive, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as Fred said, it's quite murky, and it's, I think, even murkier than people have realized. One of the key terms is, as Fred's mentioned, we, we went backwards on the number of centrifuges the Iranians were allowed to keep. And so the number got higher and higher. And so you said, well, how are you going to keep this one-year breakout timeline? And the only way to do this was to reduce the Iranian um, low-enriched uranium stockpile. And the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action parameters say that the 10,000 kilograms of low-enriched uranium that Iran currently has is going to be re reduced to 300 kilograms. Well, there are some problems with this. First of all, Iran doesn't have 10,000 kilograms of low enriched uranium. It has 7,000 kilograms of low enriched uranium in the chemical form of 10,000 kilograms of uranium hexafluoride. <coughs> Does that mean that only low enriched uranium that's in the chemical form of uranium hexafluoride is the thing that's going to be restricted? And Iran actually gets to keep the stockpile if, say, they change the chemical form from hexafluoride to oxide? Now, Secretary of Energy Moniz, I'm sorry, Moniz. Um, has weighed in on this and um, said, no, nope, not the case. He's quoted, simply converting it does not alleviate the issue. Okay, that sounds clear enough. First question, where has he been the last 17 months? Under the, the administration boasted for the Joint Plan of Action, that the Iranian nuclear program had been frozen. Um, I wrote a piece shortly thereafter saying, well, not really. I mean, the centrifuges are continuing to run. They're still producing low-enriched uranium. The administration's way around this was Iran, under the terms of the Joint Plan of Action, the old one, um, was supposed to change any, ex any extra stuff they produced since January 20th, 2014, from the chemical form hexafluoride to oxide. And in fact, has actually said, as Fred's mentioned, use the term neutralized. But now suddenly the Secretary of Energy is saying no. Indeed, I was saying no again many months ago. It's rather easy to convert oxide back. And another problem is Iran disagrees. There's nothing in the Iranian fact sheet about their getting rid of their low enriched uranium. They've talked about using it in a fuel center, perhaps, which could easily be in Iran. So they seem to clearly have in mind converting it to oxide. Until recently, there was, it was assumed, everyone assumed, at least in the US, that what would happen to this material, it would, it would be removed to Russia. But on March 29th, the Iranians said, no, we're not removing any of this. Indeed, the Iraq 
reactor, the, this reactor they have. Um, since we're going to convert it from using natural uranium to low enriched uranium to reduce the amount of plutonium it produces, the Iranians could well argue, well, hey, we need this low enriched uranium oxide to actually use it in the reactor. Another problem is though the joint plan of action required them to convert all the newly enriched material from hexafluoride to oxide, and up to now that would be about two tons of uh, low enriched uranium has been produced since uh, July tw uh, June t January 20th, 2014. They haven't done it. They haven't converted one gram from hexafluoride to oxide. This is a clear violation of the terms of the Joint Plan of Action. What is worse, the administration has made repeated false statements that in fact Iran is in complete compliance with the Joint, uh, joint Plan of Action. And um, I had, so I wrote an article about this last month, and I had a high administration official write me an email which basically said, didn't try to deny this, just tried to say, well, it wasn't very important. You know, all the, uh, the other terms it was complying with were more important. <laughs> so this setting sort of a bad example for, for, the, for the, f the future agreement if Iran now gets to sort of pick and choose which, which terms it gets to agree with. Then on the Iraq reactor, so-called research reactor, is formulated al always as a plutonium production reactor for a weapons program. Again, the parameter document says, will not produce any weapons-grade plutonium. Okay, what does this mean? I've had several people write me and say, well, how can the reactor not produce plutonium? Uh, and the answer is, of course it can produce plutonium. It can't. Well, apparently the administration, again, is trying to reverse 40 years of U.S. nonproliferation policy and hanging its hat on the term weapons-grade plutonium, which is a technical term for the, the exact composition of the plutonium isotopes. Um, and certainly the U.S. for almost the last 40 years has said, well, any plutonium can be used to make weapons, not only weapons-grade, but now the administration is going back and saying, well, no, we're hanging our hat on weapons, on the term weapons grade. What's worse, again, it's not true. The reactor's going to produce not only plutonium, again, not, not wanting to get into too much of the technical detail, when you put fuel in the reactor, there's no plutonium in it at all. As it's irradiated, plutonium builds up, and with it, these undesirable isotopes. So at some point, you get a plutonium that's not weapons grade anymore. But when you start, the stuff that starts to be made and stays in there for a while is weapons grade plutonium. There's no way around it. The physics it doesn't permit this. And so I'm assuming, and again, we don't know the details, that somehow they're going to try to put in a term that, well, they have to keep the fuel in the reactor. They're not allowed to take it out when it has the weapons grade plutonium in it. Of course, there's no way they can enforce this. I mean, as we found with the, Henry, I think, is going to talk some about the Bushir power, nuclear power reactor provided by the Russians that the Iranians have. When it started operating early on, there was a safety issue, at least so the Iranians said. There was debris in the reactor. They had to shut down the reactor, take all the fuel out. <clears throat> now, under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Actions, Supposedly, the Iranians, when they discharge fuel from the Iraq reactor, would have to, it has to leave the country. But if it's just this sort of emergency, you don't want to take it out because you're going to put it back in. At least you could say that. So it would certainly be easy enough to uh, create an emergency, take the fuel out, say, well, we're, we're working on it, we're going to put it back in at some point. So it's just not true. Though the administration has said they've, this agreement blocks the plutonium path, it clearly doesn't. Putting in low enriched uranium would reduce the amount of plutonium it produces, certainly not eliminate it. Certainly within three or four years there would be enough plutonium, even with the reduced amount, for a nuclear weapon. Finally, again, you know, I don't know who's writing this stuff, there's a low enriched uranium reactor loophole. Uh, the, the agreement says the Iranians can't produce any new, can't manufacture any new heavy water reactors. 
and using natural uranium, the reactor won't work with light water or ordinary water uh, that uh, one uses. But with enriched uranium, they could build a new <coughs> reactor of any one they want and make plutonium in that. Now, again, supposedly they're not allowed to reprocess, but if you're down to that stage, again, the uraniums can get fairly close. Finally, curiously enough, the, the key divide on this, the key issue is, what do you want, a bad deal or no deal? I mean, Secretary Kerry's still arguing, oh yes, this is a great deal, but even the, the proponents of the deal are basically saying, yeah, it's not a very good deal, I admit that, but it's better than no deal. I mean, the, the, basically the, the bad deal view is almost anything to prevent an Iranian nuclear weapon now. You know, you hope for something better, you know, and you play for time, hope there's some uh, wonderful change in Iran. They decide, oh yes, we really didn't want nuclear weapons. Um, you know, sort of ignore what happens if there isn't a change, that you pave the path for Iranian nuclear weapons. And the, you ignore this key problem that you've, and the, you really, see very few proponents of the deal even allude to this. There's a danger about spreading centrifuge enrichment, legitimizing it, saying any country can have it. Where this is gonna leave us with non-proliferation, with Saudi, maybe South Korea, who knows? Uh, they just don't wanna discuss it. Um, on the no deal side, I mean, I'd, I'd argue, first of all, there, there really isn't much threat of Iranian nuclear weapons now anyway. I've never thought so. I've always thought it was a gradual process. <coughs> Go back and look at the way Pakistan did it. They didn't race to it. They went gradually and slowly, step by step, uh, outlasting administrations, and wound up with nuclear weapons. Uh, it's unclear to me how much extra time the deal will even buy us. As Fred's mentioned, the president, you know, it's 15 years, maybe 12 years. Also, the deal just may not last. Uh, Kissinger and Schultz last week uh, referred to the danger of, quote, a gradual accumulation of ambiguous evasions. And as I've mentioned, you know, this has already gone on with the joint plan of action and this conversion from hexafluoride to oxide. They haven't done it. They haven't been called out on it. I mean, it's been considered, well, it's kind of minor. But, you know, as Kissinger, clear view of how this could be used to shorten the, the agreement even less than 10 years. I certainly consider, as I said, a change in the Iranian regime uh, very, very likely. And I, less so, you know, once you've legitimized centrifuge enrichment, even if somehow there were a miraculous change 10 years out in the Iranian program. If you've set in motion a Saudi pro program to produce a bomb, even a very democratic Iran Iranian regime might decide it has to keep centrifuge enrichment just now to deal with the Saudis and the Saudi threat that the, this agreement's created. So what, what instead, what, what I suggest? Well, I've been, again, saying this for a long time, not getting anywhere. There, key elements of the Iranian nuclear weapon program that were started because there was an Iranian nuclear weapon program, and I think the Iranians have been holding on to them tooth and nail because there's still an Iranian nuclear weapon program. Centrifuge enrichment, plutonium production reactor at Iraq, the heavy water production facility that's also at Iraq that helps this. Now this argued, well, you know, the Iranians will never agree to this. Well, we've never even tried not even as our opening negotiating position do we try to get what we should want to try to get. And if we, and it's possible the Iranians might actually agree, in which case we'd actually get a comprehensive solution to the problem of Iranian nuclear weapons. If not, I mean, I think we can continue to deter and slow Iranian progress towards nuclear weapons. I'm not sure they can be stopped at this point, but I think we can still delay and slow them using sanctions and military threats to them. And if nothing else, by taking this position, we'll have delegitimized centrifuge enrichment. South Korea and Saudi Arabia 
we can still try to head them off, if nothing else. So I'll stop at this point. Thanks. Well, thank you, Greg. Okay, Henry. You know, when I listen to this, um, I'm reminded of two quips. Uh, one is um, Israelis uh, who do military planning. They say it's very important to make a distinction between problems and facts. Now, it turns out nothing is settled yet. So we can still kind of look at it as a problem. On the other hand, it's been 25 years that we've been sort of slipping into this back brief. I remember being at the Pentagon writing a memo, I think it was to Paul Wolfowitz, saying, you know, we're sending dual-use items to Iran like we did to Iraq. We're repeating ourselves. By the way, there was a decision not to do anything about that, actually. Uh, something about maybe we can win the election with enough campaign funds. I mean, I don't know what possessed people to backslide on not getting tougher on that. But we, we really did not get tougher on Iran when it was in plain sight that they were beginning a, a weapons program 25 years ago. In any case, uh, the other thing that I'm reminded of, I don't know if Eisenhower actually said this, but people say he says it. He said, when you have a particularly intractable problem, the best thing you can do is expand it. And I don't exactly know what that means, but I think what I'm going to do today is try to paint a picture of how much worse things might be so that we maybe have different problems that we can solve. Because when I look at these problems, which you know my center has been vitally involved in clarifying, I get the sense that it's going to be difficult to get movement on what has to be done. I mean, I, I, it's conceivable, and we should try, but something tells me there are two more likely probabilities. One, no deal will be reached. I mean, it's possible that between now and then, which is, I don't know when, I guess they say maybe the end of June, um, the Iranians say, you know, uh, we, we don't want to reach an agreement right now. And maybe they think they can come back to the table and it doesn't happen. So that's one possibility. The other is they decide they want it, whatever it is, and they reach an agreement. If that happens, my hunch would be that the White House probably would say, you know, we like it too. I am not at all certain at that point how much one can rely on Congress to throw a major roadblock. Uh, what informs my judgment there is, is uh, not certain, but looking at what they've already done with the Corker legislation, I think uh, one shouldn't expect for sure that Congress will substantively uh, and significantly change the deal. Now, we don't know that, but that, that's my hunch. By the way, when I talk to people who are critics of this deal, who work on the Hill, whose judgment I trust, they think that which is a little depressing if you, you want to do something, but that's what they think. So uh, while there's a possibility that we can tighten the deal, whatever this deal is, because we, obviously we don't have much, do we? I mean, listening to these folks, it's not clear. There's a lot of things that are unclear. Uh, it might be tightened by Congress, and uh, it may very well be that whatever deal is cut, Iran would be uh, in the game of cheating and be caught in the act. I mean, all those are possibilities. And by the way, almost everything that's said about Iran in this deal talks about those possibilities. I mean, that's the news is captured by those possibilities almost by 90%. So what I'd like to do is talk about some other possibilities. Uh, this could make you feel even worse, but it will at least change what it is you might want to do a little and give you something to work on. Perhaps. Uh, if nothing else, it'll be different than what you've just heard. How's that? Okay. Just for variety's sake. Uh, I think one possibility, uh, which has not been given enough thought, uh, is the uh, Iranians might comply. Uh, this, by the way, is Netanyahu's worst nightmare, he claims. He told his cabinet, well, what if they comply? Uh, now, by the way, uh, he's got all bases covered. What if they don't? 
why was it hidden? Why? Which suggests that one of the concerns uh, may go beyond even nuclear weapons and whether Iran gets them, at least in the mind of you know, sort of the most targeted party, which is Israel. Uh, I mean, after all, they're, they're just backtracking a little. I mean, there are reasons why Iran might want to comply. I mean, one thing is, uh, if we understand the criticisms of what little we know about what might be reached, they could perhaps improve their military breakout capability and comply at the same time. All right? So that doesn't suggest that they have an interest in breaking the rules. Um, but I think there's another reason that may be more interesting why they might want to comply and why Netanyahu is so worried about this. And by the way, he did not say this, so this is me speaking. Uh, if they do comply, it's going to make more uh, people think that they're more legitimate as a state and less hostile, and that their nuclear program is shouldn't be looked at uh, primarily as a cover for a nuclear weapons program. Now, uh, that's sort of useful. You can get maybe you can get rid of the sanctions, which clearly we don't have a handle on how important that is. I, I get the sense. It's pretty important. I don't think they would have allowed even this confused uh, conclusion that we have if they didn't want to get rid of the sanctions. Apparently, that's pretty important. But we don't know how badly they want that. And we, this is what we're going to discover in the next you know, month, two months, three months, whatever. But in any case, uh, they, they do seem to understand that if they're treated normally, they not, may not only get sanctions relief, they can then turn the focus of a lot of uh, observers to eliminating nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Who, who, has, a, who has nuclear weapons in the Middle East? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Comment from the, from the audience. Well, <clears throat> how does this work? First of all, uh, I don't know whether you've noticed it, but in the last two weeks or so, there have been a lot of articles in two, two places about Israel's nuclear weapons program. One of them is in Germany, where pretty substantial people, uh, Lothar Ruhl is, is uh, you know, a guy who was very senior as a uh, defense policy, uh, uh, kind of like an undersecretary for policy in, in their system. Respected, not particularly partisan, I think. Anyway, he, he writes explaining how well Germany financed uh, the Mona. All these details. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Then, what's even more interesting is the Israeli press, which is run and conducted through censors. You know, people who say you can't say this, you can't say that. Well, the censors they have allowed all sorts of articles recently. Which makes me think, and some of them are quite astonishing uh, articles. Uh, you know, we learn that uh, Secretary Kerry's father somehow knew about Demona and, and winked or in some respect. I mean, it's quite all awesome, very detailed. Uh, could it be that Israel wants to uh, get ahead of being forced to admit that they have nuclear weapons? So that they get to say, well, yes, we have them, and not be forced to say, well, we said we didn't, but now you make it a say that we do. I don't know. But if that's true, that could open up a, a, a whole host of knock-on effects. I'm trying to be neutral. I don't know. You know, maybe nobody will care. Maybe, you know, it goes to the International Court of Justice that Germany violated the NPT by helping. I mean, I don't know where this goes. But it will change the focus, perhaps, away from Iran in a way that I don't think people are thinking about uh, enough. By the way, our brief as a government on how we talk about Israel in this is very, it needs a lot of work. I mean, I, I won't criticize it, but it's it basically, if you don't say anything, you don't look, you avert your gaze, then that's a complete thought. I don't think we can do that much longer, is my hunch. We, we, that may get jostled. All right, now, uh, the next thing that's kind of interesting is all of the analysis that you've heard so far about what we need to worry about technically is about enrichment plants, a dedicated heavy water reactor, 
Um, now, I know that both of these analysts know an awful lot more about another facility because they've written on it, so it's, I'm not criticizing them. Uh, but the entire focus of the deal so far has been on those facilities, but not on Bushir. Now, there was a piece which I couldn't have written better if I tried, and that, to my astonishment, I had nothing to do with directly, uh, that appeared, and it cites me, which is embarrassing, but there it is, uh, in today's Wall Street Journal. Uh, there are copies of this out there, some of you have them. Uh, it makes an argument that is a little incomplete, but actually very complete compared to whatever has been said publicly about this. Turns out Bushir is a big, big reactor compared to the little reactor at Iraq. And it can make a lot of weapons usable and weapons grade material. Um, and it is and has been and should be more of a concern. Um, in specific, uh, let's get some figures out here. Um, okay. Well, what I wrote down here in my notes is light water reactors can be used to make weapons grade plutonium in very significant amounts. And there, there's published material on this. Uh, Livermore did a study on a reactor basically the same size. Uh, it was the Keto reactor in, in North Korea that we were going to build, one gigawatt. Very similar. And if you take a look at that, uh, you get roughly between 30 and 60 weapons worth of plutonium a year. And you can tune the reactor by making interruptions of the sort that uh, uh, Greg pointed out, so that that material is almost entirely weapons grade. Now, people say, oh, well, but we've got this pledge that they won't reprocess. Well, you'll notice that apparently was not enough to make us not want to modify the Iraq reactor. Now, you may not like the way they're modifying the Iraq reactor, but give them some credit that they thought that they couldn't rely on a ban on reprocessing alone to insulate themselves from the fear that Iraq might be used to make fuel that spent fuel that could be then reprocessed. Why? Then did they want to modify Iraq? Well, it was simple. We can't really know where a reprocessing plant is uh, because you could fit it in a room not much bigger than this. And that facility could be built in a warehouse, would not throw off a signal. You could build it in six months approximately. And then when you took the spent fuel to it, within a week you would make one bomb's worth a day. Now people say, oh, well, but we have a ban on reprocessing. By the way, I like that feature of the deal, and I think we ought to make hay out of that, but I don't think that's a protection if you can't really verify whether there's a secret line somewhere. And it, this line, the reprocessing plant, is vastly cheaper, vastly quicker, vastly uh, uh, more efficient than, than building an enrichment center if you're just to make a bomb. Uh, for some reason, this has not been talked about, but it ought to be. Uh, by the way, there is a reasonable fix uh, for this, which I'll get into. I mean, you wrote a report uh, that was bipartisan that highlighted this danger. Uh, it was ignored. Bolton, uh, during the first term of the Bush administration, st we still opposed the completion of Bushir, and we made a fair amount about this. Uh, now, it's true, no one has ever used a light water reactor to make a bomb material. However, don't get too happy about it. What if I was to tell you that Ronald Reagan wanted to spook the Soviets and announced that, well, what he wanted to do was to use a light water reactor in Washington State, and the Department of Energy did a study, and they said, yeah, you know, they make a great weapons producer, not only for tritium, but weapons-grade plutonium. We didn't do it, but anybody who tells you you can't needs to read that history. Now, what this suggests to me is something that's not on the table and has global implications, which I like because it could be we can't do as much as we need to about Iran, for sure, in any which way. But we can work on other problems, and it may help deal with Iran. It suggests to me that we need to tighten the inspections, make them more frequent um, with regard to possible military diversions from Bushir. I failed to mention this, but it's mentioned in the article uh, this is not just sort of a wonky excursion uh, I'm giving you. Uh, you know, it, this is conceivable. 
Uh, in October of 2012, uh, you can read the news story. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it turns out the intelligence community in the U.S. sent over 12, I think maybe it was 14 drones over Bushir. And the, we know this because the Iranians complained to the U.N. Don't do that. You're invading our airspace. It's a violation of international law, blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, why did they do that? Well, Greg mentioned that they had stopped the reactor and took all the fuel out. And by any calculation that was reasonable, it looked like there was about 100 kilograms, or about 25, 24 bombs worth, of weapons-grade plutonium in that fuel. And they were flying to make sure that the spent fuel didn't leave the reactor building. Because guess what? There were no inspectors there that day. Now, I think that highlights the need for on-site and remote sensing that's more frequent, and not just for Bushir. We need to perhaps make that a standard internationally. So even if we don't get it with Iran, we should start learning with regard to future Irans and our friends and our you know, not-so-friendly uh, adversaries, I guess. We, we want to have a standard rule on this. Uh, that also suggests that uh, this 10-year problem, I mean, you either have to hope that Iran changes and becomes a friendly place, and then, of course, you don't have a problem, right? I mean, the people in Iran, a lot of them like Americans, I'm told. Now, if you just get rid of the, the people that don't like us that run the place, you know, I don't know how you do that, but, but okay. That's one possibility. The other possibility is you start using this time that you may have, 10 years, to get serious about tightening the rules on everybody else. Because as is pointed out, at the end of about 10 years, Iran gets to be treated like any other non-weapon state under the NPT, like Japan. In fact, they see Japan as their model. Well, maybe what we need to do is turn the tables on this and say, well, if we had tighter rules, then at the end of 10 years, they would have to abide by those tighter rules. Now, this sounds cockamamie, but it's not. Not as cockamamie as it first sounds. As was mentioned, we have some tight rules on some countries. South Korea, United Arab Emirates, Taiwan. We don't allow them to reprocess. They don't, they don't enrich. Uh, it turns out we also have a tight control in prospect for Iran. They say they won't reprocess it indefinitely. Well, why not? make Iran and that standard the model for, let's say, Japan, which is now debating privately whether they should open a big reprocessing plant. Let's go further. How much can we do if we were serious and wanted to be more consistent in tightening the rules? Now, the alternative is pretty clear. Lots of bombing. Maybe, if you're not lucky, bombing that goes nuclear. I don't think uh, we should settle for that right out of the box. I mean, maybe we have to do that. But I'd like to have a, a, second, a second option while we're planning for that. Um, I think those are the things that I wanted to emphasize. Uh, we can open it up for questions. But I, I do think it's important to think about how this deal may become much like the agreed framework, a fact, even if it's ugly that we have to deal with and think about what problems we should be trying to solve if this happens to hem it in and to make sure it doesn't become this international global example. You do not want that. I mean, at the very worst, you know, it would be nice if you could say, this was a mistake, uh, we had to do this, but it doesn't apply to anyone else, and we're going to make sure that everyone gets this clear. I don't know how reasonable it will be to make that case, but boy, an awful lot hangs on making it. I think we need to tighten everything else up, and I think we need to make sure that if there's anything that's useful in this agreement, that everybody else besides Iran gets stuck having to adopt it as well. And then we need to build on it. So that's not terribly rosy what I just told you, but at least it's not we have only a fact to deal with. I think we still have some problems. So on that upbeat note, I conclude. 
Okay, thank you, Henry. And before I open it up to the audience for Q&A, uh, I'd like to ask the first question to, to each of our panelists, and that would be uh, here at Heritage, uh, our primary audience is the U.S. Congress, and I see some congressional aides in the, in the audience. And if you were asked by uh, a member of Congress uh, what role uh, Congress could play in, in reviewing or strengthening or blocking if it's uh, a bad agreement, uh, or even if you don't think Congress can stop it, what, what would be uh, good areas for, uh, for hearings on this subject to go into some of the pitfalls uh, involved in negotiations? Uh, what, what advice would you give? Well, I would say, first of all, this agreement should be submitted to Congress as a treaty. Uh, even if it isn't mandated to be a treaty under the Constitution or under the law, it should have congressional buy-in. Now, this bill passed in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is sort of turning the Constitution on its head. Congress will have to have a veto-proof and filibuster-proof majority to disapprove the treaty. Maybe that's the best Congress could do. I don't know. I mean, I, I understand that Republicans and Democrats did, did agree to that. But uh, at, at the end of the day, I think Congress has to take a strong look at this, reject it outright, and pass the stiffest possible sanctions against Iran to require that it comply with existing Security Council resolutions, mandating that it stop enriching uranium, working on a plutonium plant, and explain years of weapons-related activities. I think we need to move beyond the irresponsible nuclear diplomacy of Barack Obama and his administration. I don't think it's salvageable. And I think there are many Democrats who are beginning to see that. I think they came back to Washington this week after the recess, and they were appalled at what really wasn't agreed to in, the, in this framework, the fact that there really isn't a framework. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. Uh, well, I'm agnostic as to whether the Congress should, you know, whether it should be a treaty or not, or how that should be handled. But I do think the Congress can hold the administration's feet to the fire on the whole consistency issue about <laughs> all these technical terms and, and why is it doing this here and this there, and I mean, what is its policy? Trying to get it to outline just what is a consistent policy and how does this fit together with our broader proliferation concerns? Because I have too much a sense that people who don't really know much about nuclear, which seems to be an awful lot of people, um, are just trying to manage this problem almost sort of locally and right now without thinking about any broader view. Okay. Um, I'd say there'd be three to four things. First, I remember the agreed framework. Uh, one of the things that brought it finally to an end was North Korean admission at some level that they were cheating. And so you, you know, it's very hard to count on that, you know. Uh, that was rather remarkable. But the proximate cause for getting that admission was eight and a half years in coming. It was called getting a, a national uh, Intelligence estimate. Is that what they call it? The National yes. Intelligence? Yes. NIE. Now, these things uh, can be an abomination in many respects. There's no guarantee that if you ask the intelligence community to do its work, you're going to like what they hand in. But we didn't even want to ask the question in the case of North Korea for eight and a half years. I think Congress could mandate pretty easily that there be an NIE done, I don't know, once every two years on Iran. I think you want to make sure that the executive doesn't take advantage of uh, its tasking uh, authority with regard to the intelligence community to make it so that you wouldn't really get the NIE. I think that's modest. You can do that. By the way, this saves you creating commissions, which I'm not a big fan of. Mm -hmm. use, use all the government you got. Don't create more. Uh, the second thing is, is something which uh, I heard uh, Mark Dubowitz this morning, there was a gathering, and he said a lot of very, I thought, they sounded clever, it sounded actually pretty interesting. Uh, ideas <coughs> about making sure that what Congress does have authority over, uh, which is sanctions, and creating them and getting rid of them, to some extent, in the areas unrelated to nuclear, be handled. Because as he said, it turns out there are no nuclear sanctions against Iran. They're all tied to 
things with human rights and missiles and terrorism and it's there are no unalloyed nuclear sanctions. Well, that's a lever. Uh, it seems to me one of the things he pointed out is that we're giving relief, he said, to uh, we're supposed to give relief to people who have gotten court findings that they've been. Uh, been, their family has been killed or, or maimed by, by terrorist organizations that Iran has had something to do with. We've put a hold on them getting their money. Well, he said, well, maybe you should tie a certain amount of relief given to Iran to relief given to these victims to highlight the character of the Iranian regime. In other words, do not have Congress keep a spotlight on the character of the regime through law. And I think the sanctions question and, and how, how you work it is something they actually have a lot of purview over. And I think if you keep the spotlight on the character of this regime, it will do a lot of long and short-term good. Finally, I would tighten the rules uh, with regard to nuclear uh, uh, civilian exports. I mean, it, people forget, you know, they got their nuclear program from us. We gave them nuclear cooperative agreement in 1956. Uh, I don't even think we had a hearing. We just did it. This is for Adams for Peace? Adams for Peace, yes. Well, what a misnomer. Um, in any case, I think, you know, we have to have the Congress at least behave as though they don't want to see another one of these. And that would mean they'd have to say, this is a one-off. We don't want to ever see anything like this. We've learned. I think they, they need to actually hold hearings and perhaps even make sure that the conditions are right for the upcoming agreements with the South Koreans and now the Chinese are up on deck. We want to renew the agreement with them. Uh, maybe they could call for a review of whether or not we need to revise the Atomic Energy Act in this area. Last time it was uh, looked at was 30, see, 78. How long ago was that? 37. 37, thank you. That was me. That was you. He's good. You've you got to invite him more often. You're fast. All right, so 37. Well, that's a while. Maybe it's time. And I would seven, definitely try to use that as a tool to alert to the world. We, we, this is not a model. Not only that, I would try to make the implementation, whatever you have with Iran, so um, unpleasant that maybe people wouldn't be that eager to have the exact same thing. That's what I would do. Uh, you can tell I'm sort of trying to move beyond the possibility that uh, we're going to succeed in correcting all of this. We still don't know if there's going to be a deal. We still don't know what's going to be in it. Uh, I wouldn't get your hopes up, though. Yeah. Okay. And with that, I'd like to uh, open it up for the questions. I would ask that you just uh, give your name and your affiliation, or if you, you could just say private citizen, uh, and also ask a question, don't make a long statement. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, yes, sir. Oh, wait, and also wait for the microphones to come around. Yeah, thank you. My name is Hermes Levy. I'm from OWS, which means o Occupy Wall Street. And I just would make a comment and ask the panel to comment on it. Uh, uh, being a member, member of the Occupy Wall Street, it's very significant for what is happening now because this movement was created in response of a very serious situation happening in this country and people didn't pay attention. Yeah, this, is this about the Iran nuclear? Yes, yeah. it is. Okay, could, if you could ask your question. Yeah. So uh, the country is occupied by spiritual being and one of them uh, is the one actually who suggested the suggestion to the president to do the, the Iranian deal. It's, uh, it's uh, something very not easy to understand, and maybe he is not the place. But what would be your reaction about knowing that spiritual beings are inside the US and have the government, especially the, the president and his people, do things against the country? if anyone has an answer to that. Uh, outside the scientific realm. Yeah. yeah, it's outside science. But uh, do we have any questions on the Iran nuclear uh, issue? Uh, this man right here. Uh, 
Thank, thank you. My name is Adam Prevost. I'm a student with the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Um, my question is, I, I just wanted to see what your opinion was. How do you think um, with Russia opening up its arms sales to Iran, can you foresee, um, what, what do you foresee will be the impact of that if an agreement is reached with, with Iran? Is that kind of a hedging move or, or something like that? Sure, and, and he's referring to the uh, revival, the proposed S-300 uh, air defense sale from Russia to Iran, which could complicate any uh, uh, military planning if it comes to that uh, uh, in terms of a preventive strike. Well, I, I see a parallel between the decision in 2007 to uh, authorize, basically the Russians agreed to help start up the Bushehr reactor and the recent decision by Russia to sell the S-300 missiles. In each instance, the United States telegraphed that Iran's nuclear program was going to be declared peaceful. And it did so in 2007 by a national intelligence estimate which said that Iran stopped its nuclear program in, in, in 2003. Frankly, this is a segue because I, I know Henry's position that the intelligence community should do more national intelligence estimates on Iran. I think the intelligence community's analysis of Iran has been horribly politicized. And I agree with Michael Mukasey, who recently said in a Wall Street Journal editorial that we need a Team B with the national intelligence, where national intelligence experts will look at this from another perspective. After former CIA Director John Brennan sided with this policy in a Harvard speech, a I'm very concerned about the objectivity. So I, I, yeah. I understand your position, Henry. Well, how shall I put it? Uh, I'm not sure that it's mutually exclusive. I mean, I, your point's well taken. I mean, this whole thing has gotten so politicized. I mean, the, the trick in getting a Team B is uh, not to fight fire with fire, but, you know, really get a Team B that's not, you know, more ideological in the other direction, but really competent. But there is a problem there. But uh, what triggers that is getting the NIE. If you don't have an NIE, you don't even have a debate. I, I think that's right. But jumping back to your point, I think by legitimizing Iran's nuclear program, we've given a green light to the Russians to sell these missiles. Yes. And frankly, I'm concerned we've done this with a wink and a nod, that there may actually be an agreement where we said to the Iranians and, and, and the Russians, that we will do what we can to stop an Israeli airstrike. I, I, I can't prove that, but I have a concern that there was an informal agreement that it's okay for this missile sale to go forward to stop the Israelis from attacking. Uh, uh, this woman right here. Thanks, Claire Lopez with Center for Security Policy. Um, since the Ayatollah Khomeini ordered uh, his uh, military to get the bomb in the 1980s, there's never been a time that Iran did not have a clandestine nuclear weapons program. What's the panel's assessment of uh, the current status of Iran's clandestine nuclear weapons program, not the one we're talking about, but the hidden one? Yeah, I think this is an interesting point, because the administration focuses on a breakout of known facilities, but really, we, we should be worrying more about the sneak out uh, option here. Well, well. Not to contradict you, but the, the sneak out for the fissile material hasn't bothered me. But I do think, contrary to the views that they've, as you said, they've always had a nuclear weapons program, because most people won't admit that today. And I think it's a critical point, because then when you say, well, what should we negotiate with? You, and you say, well, the centrifuge enrichment was part of their nuclear weapons program. We well, say, well, maybe they should give it up. Uh, rather than say, well, no, they'll never agree to that. And if you say, well, no, they'll never agree to that, you're only emphasizing the fact that they've got a nuclear weapons program. You've got to face that. Uh, another cut at this is if you look at uh, a good number of the missiles that they're working on, they don't really make a lot of sense unless they have some pretty fancy payloads. And... Um, I think you may not be able to, you know, get this as part of the deal and da da da. I think it's important to start talking about missiles in general, and certainly this is a very good case to work from. That also would highlight, well, why would they do this if they had no interest in getting a warhead? I think there's an awful lot we don't know about this program. There have been reports of Iranian and North Korean nuclear scientists collaborating, uh, Iranian scientists witnessing nuclear tests in North Korea. Uh, there was recently a site called Lavazan 3 announced by the NCRI, an Iranian uh, opposition group that supposedly is a secret uh, centrifuge facility. The Iranians deny it. There's been no inspectors there. 
I think there's a lot we don't know, that there could be very dangerous activities in Iran's, Iran's nuclear program going on that we don't know, which is another reason why we need an intelligence team B to look at this whole situation, stepping aside from policy to find out how dangerous the threat really is and how far has Iran's nuclear program really gone. Yeah, good point. Uh, we have time for uh, two more questions of this man right here. And, and then Thank you. Uh, my name is sorry. my name is uh, Tyler Thompson from United for Free Syria. Uh, my question is about sort of Iran's actions outside of their nuclear program and the effects that the deal will have. Um, you know, when in Barack Obama's uh, interview with the New York Times, he sort of mentions these things that that you you guys mentioned earlier, which is Iran's support for terrorism, their bad acts throughout the region, um, and doesn't he didn't connect the dots and said, well, <laughs> nuclear deal, bad acts. You know, question mark. It was, it was very, very unclear as to what what uh, this nuclear deal will do to, to slow those bad acts. And so my question is, what would the uh, nuclear deal do in this power constellation of you know U.S. policy on Iran to prevent them from their sort of uh, military expansion throughout the region? They they're military, deeply military involved in three different countries: Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Um, and with an extra couple billion dollars with lifted sanctions, you know, what would be the result of that? Not a leading question at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, I'm reminded of uh, 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 a joke, and I can't seem to get the joke straight because some people say it starts with an, an Egyptian uh, king, and other people say it's the czar. So we'll go with the czar because it's, it's a Jewish joke, so the czar sounds right to me. Uh, <laughs> Apparently the czar was very enamored of his horse. He, by the way, you're going to hear this five times in the next probably three days. So you know you heard it here first, but you're going to hear it a lot. And he loved this horse. And uh, by the way, the king was a little out of sorts. He was not all up to here, you know. So he he got it in his mind that he wanted his horse to be able to talk to his horse. You know? He was an inbred king, you know, the czar. So. He talked to his advisor, he said, could you please teach this horse how to speak? And then he said, now I want you to take this seriously, don't laugh. In fact, if you fail in two years, I'm going to execute you. So he goes back home, tells his wife. She goes, oh my God, oh my God, what are you going to do? And he says, well, it's not so bad. I mean, the horse in two years, it might die. The king might die. I don't know, maybe I'll die. And besides, in two years, maybe I'll teach the horse how to, how to, how to talk. <laughs> and I think there's a certain quality uh, in play here that's similar. And the reason that logic prevails is that the man has no choice. So he makes of what he has as positive as he can. And I think there's a lot going on here that's like that. I don't know what the connection is. And, you know, by the way, it is conceivable that, you know, the people in the street finally overwhelm the people that are over them and, and, and they're all good people and everything turns out for the best. But I don't know. I mean, I, and the problem is not having a clear alternative to this. You know, 31% of Republicans, I'm told, actually favor the, whatever this deal is. Do you know how that registers on the Hill? It's like, well, let's not get too far ahead on this. So I don't know. I think we're in a real gray area. And I, I think uh, if we focus only on the Iran matter and not see what its implications are, I'm not sure we're going to make a lot of sound choices. And we're going to make stories like, well, maybe something will happen and hope for the best. But I mean, your question was rhetorical, was it not? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, speaking of rhetorical questions, we have another question from a, a, a viewer that says uh, Iran believes that Israel does not have the right to exist, and they repeatedly state death to America, death to Israel. Does this agreement address Israel's right to exist from Iran? Well, un unfortunately, it does not. Uh, Senator Rubio attempted to put an amendment forward t to the bill that came out of. Uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee this week. I think he dropped it last minute to try to get uh, uh, the bill through. But 
it does not focus on this, and we know recently the Supreme Leader said death to, death to uh, America at a rally. We know just as recently as last fall, he put out a nine-point plan to eliminate the State of Israel. And these are one of the many questions that we've simply set aside to get this deal. As I said earlier, we said to Iran, whatever you want, whatever you need to get a deal, we're prepared to do it. Okay, and one last question from this man uh, right here. Hi, uh, my name is Aman Sharif. Um, in this case, I'm just speaking as a private citizen. Uh, I'm curious uh, whether anybody on the panel uh, has any thoughts on what uh, ability Congress and by extension the United States has uh, in terms of the impact of any sanctions if we can't get the rest of the world community to go along with us. If a deal does come through and let's say 100% people in the US don't like it, we nix the deal, but Russia, China, the EU like it, they go along with it, what, what can we do in that scenario? Very good question. <laughs> By the way, this tells you, you know, what, what levels we've been reduced. Um, I think you should not simply trim your sails to the lowest link, if you will. Uh, the United States still is a pretty important country, yeah? and people keep trying to forget this or say, well, there are other more important countries. It's not really true. I mean, we're not as good as we might think, but we're really quite far along. And the fact of the matter is, if we take a clear position on human rights, on terrorism, on what it is that we think needs to be done, it has a certain amount of sway with the others. Maybe not China, maybe not Russia, but with our friends. You may find that you have to kind of start thinking about a long-term competition kind of like a Cold War in a smaller case with regard to Iran and the hearts and minds of the citizens. I have to say, though, having said that, let's see, how have we done? We have Libya, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. Yemen. Yeah, oh, yeah, you, you keep reminding me. I can't, <laughs> a new one, Yemen. And then ISIS. I'm not sure how well we're cut out for this line of work. Uh, we seem to have a low learning curve. Anyway, but I, I think, though, that, that uh, it's true. You can't make sanctions very effective if everyone doesn't join. But you can work with friends to say, this is wrong, and you can make an example of it. It may be necessary to do that. By the way, we had to do that during much of the Cold War. We didn't have everybody on board. By the way, the Russians didn't join us in sanctioning them about human rights, last I checked nor did the Chinese. But we still did it. That one turned out better than, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it turned out better than what, what, what we had. So I'm not an expert on this, but, but I wouldn't get too Manichaean about, well, if we don't have this, then the world blows up. I think you've got to sort of persist with whatever principles you think are worth defending in a reasonable fashion, even if it's not going to work as well as it needs to for certain purposes. And I, I would just add that uh, uh, the multilateral portion of sanctions is important. That's a, one more reason the, this administration should be careful about agreeing to the lifting of UN sanctions before it has a hard and fast uh, and a, an acceptable agreement, because they're going to be very difficult to put back on. Whereas Iran has has made concessions that are easily reversible, the sanctions are not going to be easily reversible once they're lifted. They will not snap back. You know, that the whole term snap back draws attention to how difficult all this probably is. It's a very clever rhetorical tool, but it does draw attention to itself. What the heck in government snaps anywhere? <laughs> yeah. and, and with that uh, comment, let's end this uh, pa uh, panel, and please join me in thanking the speakers for some very interesting <laughs> comments.